أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وأطهار المرسلين شفيع المذنبين وحبيب رب العالمين محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين All praise is due to Allah and may his peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I bear witness that no one is worthy of worship but Allah and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his final and last messenger. My brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The whole issue of morality is of extreme importance as the brother said. Now what makes morality important is the following. Morality is the set of rules and values and principles through which or by which we choose to govern ourselves. Determining what is right, what is wrong, what should be done, what is not to be done, what we can do and what are we supposed to abstain from. And because of the consequences of morality and the consequences of immorality, this subject becomes of extreme importance very quickly. It is moral to think that human life is very valuable. Now the opposite of that is it is immoral to devalue humans. So a moral person would have respect for human life. An immoral person would not have respect for human life. So now inshallah you see the consequences of immorality and the blessings of morality. An equally important question is where do we get morality from? For example, what you consider to be moral in India may not be considered moral somewhere else. And in the West, what is considered to be moral or immoral may be considered the very opposite, for example, in the East. So now we are faced with this question. Where do we get our morality from? Who gets to decide whether an issue is moral or an issue is immoral. Islam recognizes four sources for the whole concept of morality. Or maybe we can say three. Number one, it is revelation. By revelation we mean what God said either through the Quran or through the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And generally speaking, when you look into either the Quran or the Sunnah, very rarely you see specifics. Rather, what the Qur'an does is that Allah gives general commands such as that Allah commands of righteousness and justice. But it really does not go into details as far as what that righteousness is or what that justice is. And then the following verse or the following statement of the verse says and Allah forbids all kind of immoral actions, whether they be private or they be public, and Allah also forbids injustice or aggression against other people. So now we see in Islam, it is not only a moral obligation, it is also, there is an additional meaning that is added to it, and that is, it makes it a religious obligation. For example, keeping a promise, something that we have a problem with as Muslims. Keeping a promise, people would say that it is good for your business, rightly so. It makes you an ethical person, rightly so. It makes you a moral person, rightly so. Through it, you show respect to other people, rightly so. However, in Islam, although these are all good and these are beautiful incentives, there is an extra element added and that is, it is not only right, but it is also a religious obligation. So now we see this, it is revelation. The second source that Islam recognizes as a form, a source of morality is human reasoning. 
Remember, Allah created intellect for us for a reason. So we are supposed to put our intellect in the proper channels. We cannot put our intellect in vacation and you know, just hope that you know, somebody else do the thinking for us. We have got to use our intellect and part of the intellect is that it provides through common sense what is moral and what is immoral. But now again we are faced with another problem or with another issue. Common sense, you know, is very relative. What is considered to be common sense in the East may not be common sense in the West and vice versa. Ibn Taymiyyah gave a beautiful example to resolve this problem. And he said the following. He said, the relationship between revelation and reason, revelation being wahi, Quran and Sunnah, and reason, intellect, he said that is like the relationship between eyesight and light. And then he gave the example. If you put a person with perfect eye vision in a very dark room, his perfect eye vision will not be of use to him or to her. So what that person needs for him to benefit of his perfect eye vision is that there is an element of light that is required. So he said similarly, your intellect without that guidance of revelation is like your eyesight in that very dark room. It will not be of any benefit to you if it is not accompanied by godly guidance, if we may use this term. So when we speak of the Quran respecting reason, the Quran respecting intellect, we are speaking of the intellect that goes parallel to the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the teachings of the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it gets to be very interesting when you see how people may misuse or use their intellect. We have a problem, for example, in the U.S. with people driving drunk. We call it DUI, driving under the influence. And these happen, usually they happen to be young men somewhere in the uh, early 20s. The legal age for drinking alcohol in the U.S. is 21. So what they did is this. They said, look, we have a big problem with young men driving under the influence. We need to teach them responsibility, how to be responsible so that later on we can avoid having these problems. Now, it is a good thought. It is a problem. And when we say this, we're not necessarily acknowledging the drinking of alcohol, but it is a problem and a problem that needs to be addressed. So, one of the suggestions that were given is this. And listen to it carefully, you will find it fascinating. They said, we need to teach them responsibility at an earlier age. And what they meant is that, instead of the drinking age being 21, let us bring the drinking age to 18. Now this is very interesting. The idea is to teach responsibility by an irresponsible behavior. So now we are saying that in their 20s they are not responsible. Therefore, let us make it legal for them to drink alcohol around the age of 18. It may sound good, it makes sense, but then it is not the kind of reasoning that is respected. Also very similar to that is that the Arabs earlier before the time of the Prophet wasallam, would not allow women to inherit. And when the verses were revealed, لِلنِّسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ said that women have a share of what is left by their relatives. Some of the companions came to the Prophet ﷺ and they gave what we would call a logical argument. And they said, Prophet of Allah, these women do not ride horses, meaning that they're not knights or heroes. They do not fight in the battlefield. What entitles them to inherit? You see the argument. They don't fight, they don't help in the protection of the tribe or the protection of the property or of the wealth. So now they're wondering and they're saying, what gives them the right to inherit? And that was supposedly a logical argument. So we said that Islam does respect intellect, however it has to be intellect or reasoning that goes parallel to the teachings of Allah and the teachings of the Prophet Along with this source also, there is the common universal laws that are generally accepted by people. They could be a source of defining whether certain issues are moral or immoral. 
We're not looking for consensus of the masses here. But generally speaking, the Prophet ﷺ would say, مَا رَآهُ الْمُسْلِمُونَ حَسَنًا فَهُوَ حَسَنًا He said that when the community of believers decide that a certain thing is good, then it must be good. But now the question is, it is a community of believers. When there is something that they have deemed to be good, then the Prophet ﷺ is saying that, it is good, generally speaking, because of where these people get their ideas and their thoughts from. And many times, the community does not have to be a community of believers. There is that universal common sense or universal loss. For example, stealing is wrong. Whether you are a Muslim, a Hindu, Christian, a Jew, an atheist, people know this. Stealing is wrong. Murdering is wrong. Or what we would refer to as the Ten Commandments. In the Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf, we have 12 of them. But the Ten Commandments are what we would call the universal laws that are also acknowledged by all people regardless of their creed and regardless of their religion. Also one of the ways that the Prophet ﷺ spoke of morality or immorality is by talking about the consequences of immorality. For example, in the Hadith, it was narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said one time, Ya Ma'ashar al-Ansar. He was addressing a group of people, he called them al-Ansar, and these are the people that gave him help in Medina. So he said one time, he said, Ya Ma'ashar al-Ansar. So everyone started paying attention. And then he said, Khamsu khisalin, in tudrikuhunna, wa a'udhu billahi an tudrikuhunna. He said five traits, five qualities, or five events, if they happen during your time, and I seek refuge in Allah that they do not take place during your time, there are going to be five consequences of such kind of a behavior. And listen to what the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, if people are guilty of five things, then there are going to be five consequences that are very appropriate to these five events that are taking place or these five qualities. And he said the following. He said, مَا مَنَعَ قَوْمٌ زَكَاةَ أَمْوَالِهِمْ he said that whenever people stop giving their zakah, their obligatory charity, that is the right of the poor, Allah is going to stop sending them rain from the sky. And had it not been for the animals, Allah would have never sent a drop of water on these people. But here what we see is that Morality goes beyond defining what is right and what is wrong. Morality exceeds and goes beyond the individual to say, what are the rights of other people? And if you are fulfilling the rights of other people, then you are a moral person. And if you are neglecting the rights of other people, then you are becoming immoral. So he said, whenever the rich in the community do not fulfill their rights with regard to the poor of the community, then there is going to be a consequence for such an immoral behavior. The other statement that the Prophet ﷺ said, وَمَا شَاعَةِ الْفَاحِشَةُ فِي قَوْمٍ قَطْ وَأَذَاعُوا بِهَا إِلَّا وَابْتُلُوا بِالْأَمْرَاضِ وَالْأَسْقَامِ الَّتِي لَمْ تَكُنْ فِي أَسْلَافِهِ And then he said, whenever sexual immorality spreads amongst people and they publicize it, there are going to be diseases and ailments that are going to exist in that community that has not existed in previous nations. And we can see nowadays, with all the spread of STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, how catastrophic that is. The condition that the Prophet ﷺ said is this. He said that sexual immorality has always existed, even during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Before him, after him, during the time, it has always existed. But here is the condition that he put. He said, whenever it is spreading and then it is made publicized, it is public, meaning that people behave immorally as we see it as Muslims, and no one says anything about it. He said that the consequence of it, of this immoral behavior, is that there are going to be ailments and diseases that did not exist before these people, but they're going to go in them now. And like I said nowadays, I think the average is that every four seconds, every four seconds, someone is infected with either AIDS or HIV. Every four seconds in the world, someone is infected with HIV. This is crazy. 
7,000 Africans die every single day. Every single day, 7,000 Africans die as a result of HIV AIDS. Now, we're not being judgmental against the people that have contracted it. Maybe it was through blood transfusion or what have you. But the idea is, it is known to be an STD, a sexually transmitted disease. And we can see how it is publicized nowadays. For example, where I come from in California, there is a city, San Gabriel Valley, they call it. It is the valley of pornography, where X-rated movies are made, and the average is 10,000 movies a year are made. 10,000 movies a year that glorify pornography. Now remember, like we said earlier, there is nothing with sex per se in Islam. However, what Islam dislikes and what Islam abhors is the way sex is commercialized. The way sex is limited to be an animalistic act only. And that is why the Prophet wasallam said, you earn a sadaqa by satisfying your own personal sexual passion. So it's not sex that Islam is against, it is the immorality, the wickedness that is associated with sex. And many times it gets to be very sad. It is not only when you have got the consent of the two adults or whoever it is that is engaged in it, but when sex becomes a mean of transaction. You all know about the UNICEF and what they have done in West Africa. The workers that work for UNICEF, the United Nations mission that is supposed to be helping the children of West Africa, the workers would hold on to their food. And they would say, if you want food, then what do you have to do? You have got to give us some sexual favors. And you also see how sex is used in wars, where to demolish the spirit of the other party, constantly women are raped. It is literally used as a weapon to destroy the spirit and degrade and dehumanize and humiliate the other party. You look more into it, subhanAllah, and you see even more wicked consequences. For example, in Uganda, maybe I said this briefly the other day, but what happens is you have a young boy or a young girl that was living with their parents. One of their parents becomes infected with HIV AIDS. Then they can no longer work. So now these little children will have to leave the school and support their family. Another uncle or aunt dies, and then they have the children of the other uncle or aunt coming in and moving with them. They are so poor, and now they are becoming even poorer. Or look at it the other way. You have a teacher that contracts HIV AIDS. He can no longer come to school. So a class of 50 students does not have a teacher anymore. So now the teachers are not coming to school. The students are not finding anyone to help them in their schooling. So now schools are closing down because of such an action. But please remember, it is not the sex part that Islam abhors or Islam is against. It is the way it has been practiced. And you can see again, the way it is being publicized, be it in the form of pornography, be it seen, be it in the form of pictures, be it whatever it is, it has gotten so low and it has gotten so wicked, it is unbelievable. I was listening the other day and they caught or they arrested this big huge ring, not of any kind of pornography, but they were involved in children pornography. And now people are asking, is it the constitutional right of people, whether they want to practice something like this or they do not? Simply because of this. See, in the West, what happens is that there is so much that is given as a right to the individual at the expense of the society. Where, as an individual, you have got so much right, but your rights are affecting the overall moral caliber of the society. Now, in Islam, it does both. It respects your right as an individual, but not at the expense of the moral aspect of the overall society. So drinking in your house is one thing, but being drunk in public is something else. What happens is, and this is a very interesting point, Islam wants enormities, kaba'ir, enormities, major, big, huge acts of wickedness to remain as such in the eyes of the public. And that is why the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, if you are guilty of something, do not come and publicize it. 
It is a form of hypocrisy, by the way. It is a form of hypocrisy. No argument there. However, this form of hypocrisy is a lesser evil than the society losing its respect or the way it feels about enormities. For example, you have got, nowadays it's been happening all over the U.S. You know what happened with Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinis. Now the argument is used at school. You know, when scientists, sociologists, they go around in high schools, they're asking questions, you know, they want to see the average age of a boy and a girl being sexually active, and they ask, what do you do? And they all refer to Bill Clinton as, you know, doing what he has done. And the argument that is used is, if the president can do it, then I can do it. Now what happens is, let's say if the imam or the sheikh or the scholar is guilty of something, people will say, oh, the scholar is guilty of this, the imam has done this, the sheikh has done this, I must not be bad at all. Because if these people are doing it, then I must not be the terrible person that I thought to be. So what happens is for enormities to stay as enormities, they must not be publicized. And that is how society keeps itself on a check of morality. Because again, if you say, well, this person has done so, this person has done so, what happens is that we become very desynthesized. We become very numb. We become very cold towards it. For example, nowadays, and it's funny because the way people do it is usually they use very fancy words to do that. If it is known that people cheat on their wives, it just happens so many times, oh, he's cheating, he's cheating, he's cheating. Then gradually what happens is that it becomes expected. It's no longer a surprise to most people. Why is this? Because people became very uh, desynthesized by it. And that is why the Prophet wasallam tells us about our measurement, a measurement or a standard, a reference point that we can use to see whether we are faithful or not. He said, whoever sees munkar, munkar is immorality. It could be in the form of injustice, in the form of wickedness, in the form of whatever it is. He said, whoever sees immorality, they should do something about it. They should either eradicate it with their hands, they should either speak against it, and if they're not able to either eradicate, nor are they able to speak against it because of their circumstances, what do they do? Nothing? No. He said they should at least denounce it with their heart. When was the last time you passed by a wine shop and you denounced it? I said, almost all of us, we have seen a wine shop. Now, when was the last time you saw a wine shop and you just became so irritated by that because of what you know alcohol is doing to people? But the idea is, why do you think that is happening? You pass by it every day. You see it's a wine shop. You see people standing in line by it. Then what happens? You get used to it. That is the nature of man. programs can be watched in the English section of the in-flight entertainment directory on board all Saudi airline flights, domestic and international. Sit back, relax and enjoy watching Hoda's entertaining and enlightening shows on your trip. Hoda wishes you a safe and successful journey. Hoda, a light in every home. Nowadays, it's been happening all over the U.S. You know what happened with Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinis. Now, the argument is used at school. You know, when scientists, sociologists, they go around in high schools, they're asking questions, you know, they want to see the average age of a boy and a girl being sexually active, and they ask, what do you do? And they all refer to Bill Clinton as, you know, doing what he has done. And the argument that is used is, if the president can do it, then I can do it. 
Now what happens is, let's say if the Imam or the Sheikh or the scholar is guilty of something, people will say, oh, the scholar is guilty of this? The Imam has done this? The Sheikh has done this? I must not be bad at all. Because if these people are doing it, then I must not be the terrible person that I thought to be. So what happens is for enormities, to stay as enormities, they must not be publicized. And that is how society keeps itself on a check of morality. Because again, if you say, well, this person has done so, this person has done so, what happens is that we become very desynthesized. We become very numb. We become very cold towards it. For example, nowadays, and it's funny because the way people do it is usually they use very fancy words to do that. If it is known that people cheat on their wives, it just happens so many times, oh, he's cheating, he's cheating, he's cheating. Then gradually what happens is that it becomes expected. It's no longer a surprise to most people. Why is this? Because people became very uh, desynthesized by it. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ tells us about our measurement, a measurement or a standard, a reference point that we can use to see whether we are faithful or not. He said, whoever sees munkar, munkar is immorality. It could be in the form of injustice, in the form of wickedness, in the form of whatever it is. He said, whoever sees immorality, they should do something about it. They should either eradicate it with their hands, they should either speak against it, and if they're not able to either eradicate, nor are they able to speak against it because of their circumstances, what do they do? Nothing? No. He said they should at least denounce it with their heart. When was the last time you passed by a wine shop and you denounced it? I said, almost all of us, we have seen a wine shop. Now, when was the last time you saw a wine shop and you just became so irritated by that because of what you know alcohol is doing to people? But the idea is, why do you think that is happening? You pass by it every day. You see it's a wine shop. You see people standing in line by it. Then what happens? You get used to it. That is the nature of man. If you, what happens is that when you are constantly bombarded with it every day, every day, every day, you tend to accept it. Or it no longer has the effects on you than it did before. And you've seen that. People usually know this. See, they don't give you an enormity all at once. Rather, it is done very gradually. You know, you can see it with TV. It does not start right away, but rather they, they wean you into it like they wean a baby, little by little, gradually here and there, so that you become at least, if you are not fully accepting it, at that point, you become a complacent with it. You know, it no longer bothers you. And that is why Islam says that it is not enough that you only be a moral person, but you should also be an advocate of morality, and you should stand in front of immorality. Be proactive and do not be passive. You cannot say it's wrong and then do not do anything about it. So the Prophet ﷺ will speak about communities and how they are going to lose, how communities are destroyed as a result of this kind of immorality. Like, for example, the Prophet ﷺ said that the destruction of the children of Israel started with what? He said that it started with immorality. You know, the relationship between men and women. And in Islam, we believe that there should be a gap between men and women. There should be a distance, an emotional distance, as well as a physical distance. Not that we are afraid of one another. It is just the nature of men and women, where women are attracted to men and men are attracted to women. And Islam is a very pragmatic, it is a very practical religion. It does not wait for things to happen and then advocate, you know, it does not or for the illness to take place and then prescribe the medicine. Better than waiting for the illness to take place is that you try to avoid it before it takes place and that is why it uh, advocates what it does advocate. But immorality is not only in the form of lust and the desire. The Prophet ﷺ goes on speaking of the consequences of immorality and then he said in the same hadith, in the same prophetic saying, he said, and then whenever people are not honest in their measurements when they're doing their transaction, Allah is going to give the domination 
Allah is going to make their enemies prosperous فَيَأْخُذُوا بَعْضًا مِمَّا فِي أَيْدِيهِمْ And their enemies are going to get a hold of what these people possess. Let me say this one more time. So that whenever people are not honest in their transaction, in any form it comes, be it in the form of money, when you are selling, when you are buying, because it is immoral. You should be as honest as possible when you are selling or buying or there is any transaction that is taking place. He said whenever people become guilty of this, what happens is that, and people know about it, they all become complacent to this immorality that is going on. They don't do anything about it. It is their enemies that are going to be prosperous at their expense. He said, They will take some of what these people possess. They could have been enjoying it. It could come in the form of oil. It could come in the form of cheap labor. It could come in the form of intellect, where instead of you spending it on your own place, your own country, it is going somewhere else. But here the Prophet ﷺ is speaking of a different kind of morality that people usually don't pay attention to. You know, when, when we usually speak of immorality, it has to do with our behavior towards the other sex. But that's not where it ends. Islam takes it way beyond this point, my brothers and sisters. And then also the Prophet ﷺ speaks of injustice. And he said whenever people rule by other than what Allah has revealed, then he said that the people who are going to lead are will be amongst the most oppressive. They're going to be amongst the tyrant and they're going to torture the people that they rule. Again, simply the question now or the point is this. You see immorality, you have an obligation towards it, my brothers and sisters. And Islam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stands for morality. You know, it's so beautiful the way the Prophet ﷺ spoke and advocated for Islam and he said, I was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to complete the perfection of good character or the perfection or good manner or the perfection of morality. He is summing his mission. He said, my mission is about spreading morality in all aspects. And again, we said the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he speaks, he speaks in these general terms so that any act of goodness will be considered to be a religious act no matter how secular it may be no matter how personal it may be the idea is about morality so it's not enough that you only be moral but make sure that we are advocates of morality let me tell you about some of the immoralities that are out there in the community but people are not aware and remember we're not talking about the obvious because uh, they say that which can easily be seen by the eye is easily, usually, is easily missed. It is not seen. It is so close, yet it is so far. And, you know, we, we mentioned some of it, be it with the issue of divorcees, be it with the issue of honor killing. And again, it really does not matter who is guilty. It, it really does not matter whether these people are Muslims or non-Muslims. It does not matter. When you see wrong in your community, unless you do something about it, it is going to creep into your own community. You cannot say these are the problems of the non-Muslims, these are the problems of this party or this part of the nation. That is not Islamically acceptable. Because it does not concern you, it does not mean that it should not be corrected. Rather, whenever you see wrong, you've got a moral and an ethical obligation with regard to that. We said about the divorcees and how they are dehumanized. About the widows, again, and how they are unwanted. About AIDS patients and how they are uh, outcasted by the community. About the reverts that do not necessarily sometimes receive the same amount of respect as other people uh, do. About prisoners that are being put prison wrongly and justly for political gain and the community is not doing anything about it. What about them? Who's speaking on their behalf? Today it is him or it is her, but then what happens tomorrow when it is your turn or her turn? Who's going to speak on your behalf? And that is again why we say morality is not just you being moral or you being good. You must be an advocate of that goodness. You must embark that mission, my brothers and sisters. You know, maybe we have repeated this so many times, but we said that as a Muslim, with pride, it means that you are a holder of right. Part of the obligation that you have as a holder of right is that you see into it that you contribute positively to humanity. And there is nothing better, absolutely nothing better than help the area around you wherever you may be in making sure that you are a strong advocate of justice and you are a strong advocate of morality. And the Prophet ﷺ would say, 
وأتبع السيئة الحسنة تمحها وخالق الناس بخلق حسن. He said that اتق الله حيثما كنت. Be conscious of Allah wherever you may be. اتق الله حيثما كنت وأتبع السيئة الحسنة تمحها وخالق الناس بخلق حسن. He said that اتق الله حيثما كنت. Be conscious of Allah wherever you may be. Does not matter. You're traveling, you are at home, what have you. For morality is not what we do in public. Morality and ethics is what we do when no one else is looking. And if you are ever guilty of doing something bad, then make sure that you rectify for it by doing something that is good. And this, the Prophet said, will wipe it away. So as a Muslim, you are always engaged constantly in the concept of islah, rectifying. Be it a mistake that you yourself is guilty of, or be it the mistakes of other people that are guilty of, and that is the concept of islah. And then finally he said, وَخَالِقِ النَّاسَ بِخُلِقٍ حَسَنٍ And then he said that whenever you deal with people, make sure that you have got the best of manners when you are engaged uh, with this. Uh, this was the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the advice that I give to myself and this is the advice that I give to my brothers and sisters. Wa jazakumullah khair. Wallahu alam sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad. Jazakumullah khair, brother. Now, any questions? Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Imran. I put forward a question to you. Uh, Quran uh, very often mentions about Munkar along with Fahish. For example, talks about salat. He said, "Inna salata tanha al fahshai wal munkar." What's the difference between fahish and munkar? It's a beautiful question. You know, Arabic is an extremely, extremely rich language. It is so rich. Arabic is so rich that we do not have synonyms in Arabic. Well, can you believe this? It, the language is so rich that there are no synonyms. Not two words mean the same thing. That is a very, very rich language. Let me say this one more time. No two words in Arabic mean the same thing. They may be talking about the same thing, but they never mean the same thing. Every single word has an additional meaning that the other word does not have. So generally speaking, fahsha and munkar, they talk about the same thing. It is about immorality, it is about wrong, it is about injustice. But fahsha means the following. When you say that something is fahish, meaning that it is either publicly, meaning that it is taking place publicly, it is public immorality, versus munkar being an isolated immorality. One is publicized and the other one is private. So Allah says the prayers, the five daily prayers that you do, they are supposed to purify you from being guilty, whether it be in public or being guilty, whether you be in private. And that is the difference between fahsha and munkar when they are used in that sense. And amazingly also, whenever Islam speaks of these rituals that we perform, it does not praise it because the salah itself. Salah is not praised because of it being salah, but rather it is praised because of the expected and potential consequences of salah. So he said, be engaged in salah, for salah will help you in cleaning yourself from both public and private wickedness or immorality. And that is why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used to say, مَنْ لَمْ تَنْهَهُ صَلَاتُهُ عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ لَمْ يَزْدَدْ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا بُعْدًا If your salah does not help you to abstain from munkar and fahsha, from public and private mistakes, wrongdoings, he said, it is only taking you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this is not to say that we expect perfection. But the idea is there has got to be consequences for your good deeds. If your good deeds, you do them in action, but they become only very mechanical, they become only ritualistic, you're only bothered about the goodness of the appearance of your ritual, then at that point, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is making the statement that it's only taking you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now the idea is any act of ritual in Islam must have a what? It must have a moral consequence to it making you constantly a better person. Zakah, soften your heart. Siyam, makes you restrain your lust and your desires. Again, with the issue of salah, like we said, it helps you abstaining from, you know, these acts of wickedness, and Allah knows best. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Muhammad Fadur Rahman Abdullah. 
uh, I have seen so many times, even in this congregation, wherever there is a moment of praise worthy, people do clap. I would like to know whether it is permissible in Islam or if it is not, then how do we celebrate these moments? Jazakallah khair. Now people have different ways of expressing appreciation to what they hear or to what they see. And depending on the culture that they belong to, so long that what they do does not go against the teachings of Islam, it is accepted. For example, some people used to praise Allah, they say takbir. If you go into Egypt, for example, and you've been to Egypt, every time someone does something, you know, everyone screams, Sallallahu ala Muhammad, you know. And it is a beautiful way of rejoicing. But in his fatwa, Sheikh bin Uthaymeen, may Allah bless his soul, he passed away. He said that there was nothing wrong with clapping if that is what people are used to in showing their appreciation. Jazakallah khair. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Yoganandan. This soul expresses thanks to Allah. So this soul wants to ask the one question that is the concept of the marriage at the point of view of Allah and at the point of religious point of view and the philosophical point of view in Islam what it is? Very quickly Islam sees marriage as a contract. Meaning that there is a proposal in the contract there is an acceptance of the proposal in the contract in the presence of witnesses with the mahar that is given once that takes place then the man and the woman are seen as a husband and a wife however Islam makes the following point and that is the whole concept of marriage is made so simple in Islam if two people want to be together then Islam says be together and what the marriage license does or when they come to the Imam, what that does is that it adds an ethical value to the relationship. And that is how marriage is different, you know, when people have relationships. There is an ethical value because the marriage license is nothing but a documentation of the event that so and so person on so and so date in the presence of so and so person, given the dowry of this, have agreed to get married. It is really documenting the event and that is it. However, it is not in the legal value that that marriage license is important. Rather, it is in the ethical value that marriage is important. For example, when a husband is marrying a woman, what do they say? They say that I am marrying you according to the book of Allah and according to the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now I have attended some non-Muslim weddings in the state. I really don't know what people say here in India, but people in the states, what they do is that they exchange vows. What they say, you know, is I promise to love, to honor, to nourish, to respect this person until death do us apart. Undoubtedly, these are beautiful words. You know, when you give the person that, you know, your assurances, I promise to love you, to honor you, to respect you, to nourish you and what have you. These are beautiful words. However, the belief in Islam is this. When you are saying that I am making Allah my witness that I will take care of this woman. It is not what we do in public that matters most, but what happens when we are by ourselves alone. So you tell the woman, don't worry, I made Allah my witness that I will take care of you. And the woman is saying back, don't worry, I am making Allah my witness that I will take care of you. So this way, there is that added ethical element into the whole concept of marriage. Also in Islam, it is not enough that the technicality of marriage are followed and that's the end of it, where we have this and we have that. It just makes it legal, it does not necessarily make it moral, it does not necessarily make it happy. And that is why I said earlier, is marriage in Islam is not about two people getting married to be happy, it is about two people getting married to make each other happy. And that's a very important point to make. So Islam speaks of marriage and he said that the point of marriage are two things. He said that, uh, He said that Allah has, has prescribed, it is mentioned in Surah Al-Rum. But what happens is Allah speaks and says, Of his signs is that he has created you of dust. And then the following verse said, And of his signs is that he has created maids for you. And then the third verse says, the following verse says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And of his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth. Now remember this, the sign of marriage is mentioned before the sign of the creation of the heavens and the earth. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this is indeed a very important matter. Allah says in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَوْفُوا بِالْعُقُودِ O ye who believe, fulfill your vows. 
Fulfill your pledges. If you made a promise, make sure that you carry it on. And the best vow that we made, the best pledge that we made is our pledge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we worship none but Allah. And the second most important one is the contract of marriage. Yes, brother. I'm Ravi Chandra, non-Muslim. I want to ask a question that, what is Islam? Today, and we know that it took a lot of courage, so thank you for spending some of your day with us here today. Islam is derived from the root verb salima or aslama, which means three things. To be in the state of salam means that you be in the state of peace. And we said that there are three aspects to this peace. Peace with your creator, peace with yourself, and peace with the creation of God. Also, Islam means to surrender or to submit. And at that point, we're talking about surrendering and submitting to the will of God. So you are acquiring peace and contentment by surrendering your will to the will of God subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, the word Islam could be, because Arabic is a Semitic language and it revolves around root verbs. One of it is salima, which means that which is in the state of wholeness or that which is in the state of completeness. So when I greet a Muslim brother or a Muslim sister, I say, Assalamu alaikum. May you be in the state of wholeness, the state of completeness, where there is no deficiency in your life, in your health, psychologically or emotionally. And a person that adheres to the religion or to the teachings of this religion is called a Muslim. Hope I answered your question. Yes, brother. I wanted to just find out from brother Yasir, if the loan has been taken for construction of a mask from a bank, is it permissible? Yes, I did mention that as part of my speech. You did hear me correctly. Unfortunately, that is what has happened. It was a building that was purchased and later on the people wanted to convert it to a masjid. But initially it was just so when I got there, the loan was already taken and the building was already purchased. And uh, probably the reason why the brother is asking is that taking a loan from a bank means interest. And that is we wanted to clear the building of any interest as soon as possible. And Alhamdulillah, once we came in, within exactly 45 days, the loan was paid back to the masjid. Alhamdulillah. <laughs>